Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless all of you. Thank you, Tim, for opening. Great job as always. Suzanne and Peter, great job there. Abbreviated worship team. Hallelujah. Worship light. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. God is good. Amen. I told Peter, he asked me why I was, I didn't get here until 6.30. I mean, yeah, 6.30. He asked me why I wasn't here at 5.30, and I said, I said, why weren't you here? You said you'd be Yeah, well, I, I really oh. didn't, but he was trying to mess with my head. And uh, I just said, well, I've had amnesia for as long as I can remember. <laughs> he said, Lord. But you're doing better. You remember you said that. I'm doing good, yes. <laughs> it's, coming, it's all coming back to me now. <laughs> exactly. So here's the, the word for the wise today is that if you have to borrow money, Always borrow from a pessimist because they don't expect to get it back. That's right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. We'll get right to the Word of God. And we're going to be, as always, it's Wednesday night, so I try to be brief. Everybody can get out of here and get home at a reasonable time so you can get up and do it again tomorrow. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So Mark chapter 2, Peter, if you will, we want to read Mark chapter 2, and I want to read verses 1 through 12. Mark 2, verses 1 through 12. Praise the Lord. God is good. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful for His faithfulness. Amen. And again, He entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that He was in the house. Straightway, a man... Straightway, many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. They come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there was a certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Praise the Lord. So I want you to notice something tonight. The close connection here between forgiveness and healing. And the tearing off of the roof, now, it reminds me of the veil being rent in twain, the veil being torn, amen, and opened up in the Holy of Holies. Let, let's look at this in Luke chapter 23, verse 39 through 46. Luke 23, 39 through 46. So forgiveness and healing are just so close to one another in this, and the way this man gets to Jesus is like they tear back the veil, they pull back the thing that separates him from the presence of God, amen? So one of the male factors which were hailed, hanged, railed on him saying if thou be the Christ save us so one of the one of the two guys that were that were crucified with Jesus one of these uh, criminals uh, he says if, if, if you're the Christ save yourself and us but the other one answered and rebuked him saying dost not thou fear God seeing thou art in the same condemnation and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds but this man hath done nothing amiss and he said unto Jesus Lord remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Praise the Lord. Jesus invites this guy into paradise. And immediately after, this guy's looking for forgiveness. 
he's looking for anything, for hope in his last moments. And Jesus says, this day you'll be with me in paradise and the veil is torn apart. Access to the presence of God for everybody now. Amen? Look at Hebrews 10, verse 17 to 22. Their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So just like this thief on the cross next to Jesus... Forgiveness is also connected to restoration. A fresh start. Amen? That's the true power of real forgiveness. Healing. Praise the Lord. A fresh start and healing is what forgiveness brings every time. 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 through 24. 1 Peter 2, 21 to 24. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who, his own self, bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So here's the deal. The world finds Christianity and Christians, in fact, weird. They think we're weird for all sorts of reasons. Some of them are justified, some of them not. But I would hope that they find us weird for what was most weird about Jesus. If people say I'm weird, I hope they're saying I'm weird in the way Jesus was weird. Amen? Not religious weirdo, but just being radical about the incredible, outrageous gift of God's grace. We, should, we ought to be found weird. We ought to be found weird for our ability to forgive those that are considered unforgivable. Praise the Lord. Because to do that, it's irrational. It's inconceivable. It's countercultural. But it glorifies God. Hebrews 12, 15. Looking diligent, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 4, 31 32. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So not only is forgiveness healing to the forgiver, but it's healing to the forgiver. Praise the Lord. God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing. When you give forgiveness, when you release grace, it flows through you. You're, you're, you become a recipient of the very thing you're giving away. You can never outgive God. The more you give, the more He flows through us. Amen? When we embrace grace rather than judgment, whenever we free somebody of their debts, we enjoy the same grace and the freedom for ourselves. Praise the Lord. Now, I've been talking about grace. I mean, I've been preaching grace for a number of years, but... I've been talking about this specifically in terms of, of, of forgiveness and, and so forth over the last few weeks. But it's, it, God has so impressed me with this because it be, it's become real to me now in ways that it never has been before. Not that I didn't know that I needed grace, not that I didn't know that I needed forgiveness and, and all of that, but how radical grace really is. 
how amazing God's grace truly is. How merciful and forgiving God truly is and therefore wants us to be. It's easy to receive it sometimes when you need it. It's not quite as easy sometimes to have to be the one that it flows through. But this is exactly what Jesus came to show us. This is exactly why we exist as a church, as a body. And if we don't understand that, then we have missed the fundamental, basic teaching of Jesus Christ. Amen? He came to seek and to save that which was lost, to forgive the unforgivable. Amen? Matthew chapter 5, I want to read verses 43 through 48, Peter. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. Because I really believe that we're, give, we're being given an opportunity to be a true revelation of Jesus. An honest to God opportunity to be like Christ. And I'm not talking about living our lives without flaws, without, you know, without uh, imperfections, but being able to reflect the truth of who and what Jesus is and what He's all about. Amen? You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans do so. For ye, ye, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. He tells us how we can be like God. And it isn't that we don't ever make mistakes or that we don't have thought, but we love the unlovable. We forgive the unforgivable. We give grace where it's unearned, unmerited, undeserved. Praise the Lord. Forgiveness is unnatural. And it's unnatural because it runs counter to our sin nature. Praise the Lord. That's why the world has troubles with this. Amen. And if we're no different than the world, then we're not, we really don't have anything to offer them. But the problem with this is it's unnatural to the natural man. It's only natural to the supernatural. Praise the Lord. That sin nature demands that others live up to a personal standard that we can't even meet ourselves. That was the issue Jesus had with the Pharisees. He said, you're putting demands on them that you don't do yourself. You can't comply with it, but yet you're making a, a demand on them. Amen? That's self-righteous. That's sin. It, it's so difficult. I mean... In all honesty, when you really think about it, it's so, it's almost impossible to fathom unmerited favor. Nothing in this natural world works that way. Here it's, you earn it. You do something to get it. It's reciprocal, you know. You don't just get it because they want to do it. You have to do something, amen, to deserve it. It's just, grace can be confusing. It, it True grace is bewildering. It's e it can even be infuriating. Because the people you don't like, you don't want them to have it. Amen? But they get it. They, they have a right to it for, as, from God's perspective. Amen? They, they don't have to do something in order to get it. it. It's there for them. It's a question of whether they will receive it. John 8, uh, verse 3 through 11. So the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote in the ground as though he heard them not. So then, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. 
And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So Jesus encounters this adulterous woman and then offers her these words of hope, this, an opportunity for a fresh start, an opportunity to, to, to begin again. Amen? Forgiveness. Mercy. Amen? He's basically told her, you're not your worst behavior. That's not who you are. The enemy wants to define you by the worst thing you've ever done or the, the bad thing you might do or think or whatever. And that's Jesus is doing just the opposite. He's telling her, your worst behavior is not you. That, that isn't your identity. Amen? She was more than a woman who slept around. She was a child that God wanted to be in her family. Praise the Lord. See, the, the spirit of Christian forgiveness isn't, I forgive you because I'm a great person. The spirit of Christian forgiveness is, I forgive you because I know I desperately need forgiveness myself. I forgive you because God has forgiven me. Matthew 23, verses 3 and 4. Let me jump around a little bit in there, Peter, but that's where I want to start. Matthew 23, verses 3 and 4. All therefore whatsoever they, they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say, and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. He says, what they tell you to do, you should do. But don't do what they do. So it's kind of the old, do what I say, not what I do. Only Jesus is saying about these Pharisees, because he said, what, he's, what they're telling you is the, is the Bible. So you should do what they say, but don't do what they do, because they're hypocrites. They give you these, these challenges that are impossible for you to meet, and then they do absolutely nothing to help you. All they do is then condemn you for it, because you're unable to do what they know going in, you're unable to do. That's why we have to have sacrifices. You know, under the old covenant, right? So, uh, verse 13. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Jesus knows nobody's getting into this thing by their own good works, by their own perfection. It takes forgiveness. It takes mercy. It takes grace. Amen? Verses 23 and 24. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm, look, I realize there may be big and little sins when it comes to the pain that they inflict, the consequences that they bring. But we're all in the same boat when it comes to sin. If you look at it in the scope of eternity, and that's how God looks at it, we all are born into this life on equal footing. When it comes to sin, we're all the same. And we all shuffle off this earth deserving the exact same thing regardless of what we have done or not done. But it's through Christ that we receive this awesome grace, forgiveness. Undeserved, unearned, unmerited. That's the only difference. We come in the same, we go out the same. The difference is the results of our going out, if we are in Christ, we are not condemned. We've been found not guilty. We've been declared innocent. But the truth is, every one of us came into this, every one of us go out the same, outside of Jesus Christ. 
Matthew 9, verses 10 through 13. To me, it's humbling. It makes me have to look in the mirror. It makes me have to say, like Paul, I am the worst sinner. I'm the cheapest. He didn't say, I used to be. He said, I am. Praise God. It came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So here's the deal. How arrogant would it be not to forgive others? How sinful would it be to be stingy with grace? Amen? To selfishly hoard God's grace, withholding it from others. I mean, it sure wouldn't demonstrate that we've been changed. It wouldn't demonstrate that grace did anything for us. Praise the Lord. John 1, 1 through 5. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. That light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Verse 14, we beheld His glory, amen. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So God became incarnate in a man, Jesus Christ, who is the embodiment of God's forgiveness. Amen? God manifest in the flesh. He did that. He manifest Himself in the flesh so that grace would have a face. Praise the Lord. That is the active work of the incarnation of Christ. And it's our ministry as believers. Our ministry as believers is to put a face on grace. Jesus went away and left a body here. Our job is not to, not to beat people up, you know, with rules and regulations. I'm not saying that, you know, anything goes and it doesn't matter. I'm just saying our Jesus did not do that, except with the religious people. When he came to people who were failing and, and, and coming short and, and doing all sorts of whatever despicable thing you want to name, he put a face on grace. He gave God a physical image. And that image was mercy, forgiveness, and an opportunity to have another start, to, to try again. That God would give you another opportunity. That God would not wash His hands of you. That God would not give up if you wouldn't give up. That's the active work of Christ. Praise the Lord. Last scripture here. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 and 19. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. We can dumb this down to where this is all you've got to worry about. Uh, we, we want our personal relationship with the Lord. We need to, you know... Read the scriptures, and that's how we communicate. As Tim was saying, that's how we communicate with God. That's the easiest way for God to speak to us. But our real purpose is simply to reveal Jesus. How are you going to do that? By being perfect. If, you, if that's what you think, you're going to fail. And you're going to disappoint people. But if you realize that your purpose is to be the face of God's love and mercy and grace... Now, there's an opportunity for God to move in people's lives. There's hope. There's restoration. There's healing. There's a fresh start. All things are God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. God told me this 30-some years ago, and I could not get my head around it exactly. I mean, I understand reconciliation. But this, to me defines it 
exactly. It's not giving them my doctrine. It's not teaching them my theology. It's giving them Jesus. He gave me reconciliation. Now he asked me to just do the same thing. That's all I'm asking of you. I reconciled you. Now you be a reconciler. You've got to do it the same way. By mercy, by grace, by forgiveness. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Praise the Lord. See, love and forgiveness given by God to those who don't deserve it. So they will give forgiveness, healing, restoration. So they will remove the veil and reveal the face of grace. Be ye perfect, even as your Father is perfect. That's how we can be like God. And that's what He's asking us to be. Sometimes we get hit in the face with things, blindsided by things, thinking that how horrible and so on and so on. And it is bad. I'm not saying that, that it isn't bad, but I'm saying it's also an opportunity for us to go deeper in our relationship with the Lord, to have a clear understanding of what He's really asking of us. And I, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm getting out of all this, is that God is showing me the real purpose for us being here, is to put a face on grace, to, to tear that veil. People are still struggling with it, the presence of God. Amen? They're, they're still thinking he's, there's something between him and them. And he's put us here to rent that veil and give grace a face that people can see and interact with. To do that, we have to show mercy. We have to give grace. We have to give forgiveness where, even in a situation where it's unforgivable. Because that's exactly what our Father did. And he said, if you want to be perfect like your Father, you've got to do the same thing. Amen. I'm telling you, the more you realize this, the more unfathomable it becomes. There's no end to this. As humans, we, we always want to, that's, I draw the line there. But we can't. Because God never did. And so we can't either. We have to be the face of Jesus in this world. We have to be the embodiment of of God's love and mercy and grace. Otherwise, there's no hope for this world. They don't need more religion. If that's what they needed, Jesus would have came and given them another religion. He came to fulfill the requirements of religion so that we could have a relationship. And that's our responsibility now is to bring others into that relationship. To be reconcilers. Because we've been reconciled. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise Amen. The Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amazing grace. And the more you think about it, the more amazing it becomes. Praise the Lord. We have such a beautiful, forgiving, merciful, loving God. We are so special because of that. We have such a, a huge, huge opportunity to start over every day. Multiple times a day, even. Amen? Lest you're thinking I've done some horrible thing. <laughs> I haven't. I mean, I've done some stuff. I mean, you know what I'm saying. But this is, I'm, not, I'm not on a guilt trip here. I'm not trying to get shame off of me. I'm just saying, this is the way it is, man. I mean, we, we all come short. And if we start measuring ourselves among ourselves and, and looking at somebody else's actions and comparing that to mine, then it's easy to say, oh, well, yeah. I mean, gosh, they, they need some kind of punishment. There are consequences, but they don't come from us. What we give is love. What we give is mercy. What we give is grace. What we give is the person of Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came by him. Praise the Lord. So to offer anything other than that would be antichrist, to be quite honest with you. I know we're, we want to find some guy in the cloud somewhere, you know. But I'm telling you, there were many antichrists. In Jesus' time, he said it himself. And to do anything un or opposite of Christ is to be anti-Christ. Praise the Lord. I want to be Christ-like. And this is the way we do it. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. Appreciate your patience tonight. God bless all of you. Have a great rest of the week. Hope we'll see you Sunday.
If not, be somewhere where you can worship the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.